This is who we have. I don't know if, I think many of you probably know Steve Conway. He joined us about a year ago. We also added uh, Frank Richardson, Director of Client Relations. And to keep you straight on who's here today, that's Addison Snell, founder, CEO. He's the Tom Cruise of HPC. Me, I'm the Don Rickles of HPC. And you got me today, but I'm the casino from that movie, Don Rickles. You students in the front probably don't know who Don Rickles is. Look him up. You'll be surprised. It's pretty good. Okay. This is from our technology survey, recent technology survey. Uh, we went, we had about 172 respondents and I go through and wash them very, very thoroughly. So we actually know who responded to the survey and they're verified. And that's one of the big things, a big part of my job is making sure that our research is as accurate as it possibly can be. I could have done that. I should have done that. Okay, I should have done that. Fair enough. So what we're asking about in this technology survey is pretty much everything you can think of plus a little bit more. What kind of systems are they using? What sizes? Who are the vendors? Processors, accelerators, liquid cooling, things like that. And I'm gonna go through and give you sort of some highlights from it, why I think it's really important. Uh, system vendors, Dell is consistently mentioned more often by customers than really anybody else. But if you look at system size, HP is in the lead on that, uh, followed by Supermicro. And we're putting NVIDIA in here because they are selling a lot of systems. Now, they don't break down at all. Uh, how many DGX systems they're selling, pods, super pods, all that kind of stuff, versus uh, HGX boards, versus PCIe GPUs, versus actually any of the Mellanox stuff. That just goes into one big bucket called data center. And it was 15 billion last year, which is big. Uh, Lenovo is showing up. They're out there, of course. Uh, IBM kind of decommitting from HPC. It's been a trend of, of several years. So CPUs, big battle between Intel and AMD, as I'm sure you all know. And it's really started in earnest in 2020 in our survey then. And AMD CPUs have done nothing but grow. And taking a look at the, you know, 26% of the usage, we're asking them by workload percentage. 26% uh, is AMD CPUs now. Customers expect it to go to 30%. They also expect uh, the AMD APU, which is the combined CPU and GPU coprocessor, to go to 6%. And I, I think that could go a little higher. And, you know, all of this is kind of coming out of Intel's hide, out of their market share. But they've got a pretty good roadmap. It's just kind of a, a matter of executing on it, which is pretty tough in this business. A couple of things to point out. NVIDIA Grace. I had 5% of our last tech survey say they were using NVIDIA Grace. And I'm looking at that and going, no, you're not. That hasn't been released yet. You're not using it. So I went back out. It made me suspicious. Went back out and followed up with them individually and said, you said you're using NVIDIA Grace, how? NVIDIA had a very broad remote access program and damned if they weren't using it. So this has become ingrained in customer minds and it looks to probably double at least in the next uh, 18 to 24 month timeline as you can see in the future. The other one that's really interesting is risk five. How many of you, you all have heard of risk five, right? Open source um, uh, instruction set, free essentially, use it in a lot of embedded stuff. Um, 
And I've been really curious about if and how it's going to be adopted in HPC. And so far, in the last three surveys where I've asked about it, very little interest from actual HPC AI customers and users. However, and that, that's, kind of that's kind of made me lean towards this is going to be for embedded and special purpose things and probably not going to show up in a data center near you. However, what is changing my mind, a couple of things, but the number one is China. China is, of course, going with, we've known this for years, as much homegrown as they can. They don't want to have to depend on anybody. They don't want to be um, vulnerable to export restrictions or anything like that. Risk five is a route for them to home grow essentially whatever they need. And they do have the labor and the trained folks to be able to, to customize those, those API or the, um, uh, yeah, the chips to the instruction sets to what they need, accelerator, CPU, whatever. So I think that that could put a big fire under risk five. Now, whether it sort of, that ecosystem gets developed and it becomes a viable option for the rest of us, that's still unknown. But it could be something that makes it uh, risk five on the high end a real player. Perceptions, this is a really interesting question. We basically ask uh, users if they're particularly impressed, very impressed, neutral, unimpressed, very unimpressed about various things. And as you can see, AMD, Intel CPUs, they're impressed, absolutely. They're also impressed with the AMD APUs, NVIDIA ARM, uh, the Grace Hopper, not so much with other ARM CPUs. It looks like NVIDIA has, has really grabbed the high ground when it comes to x86 alternatives. I keep expecting and have been expecting FPGAs to come out better. I mean, it seemed like a couple of years ago at supercomputing we had the year of the FPGA, but really hasn't. I think the, the, program, the perceived programming model for FPGAs, other than for Wall Street and some other niche things, is, is seen as a hurdle. And we just talked about risk five. Quantum computing. Asked a few questions about this. And this first question, we have a clear and compelling use case for, or use cases for quantum computing. Not so much. 35% say no, 30% say yes, the rest are in the don't know category. The majority, 60%, large majority, say they believe that usable quantum computing is 10 years away. Uh, but again, over half are looking at it and looking at it fairly closely. And it's kind of hard to tell whether it's offensive that we know what we want to do with this, this is really going to help us, or if it's defensive, we don't want to miss out on something that's going to be big. Uh, I can't go into a lot of detail with the, in these surveys because it ends up to be way too many questions. This is really interesting data here. 89% of the users that we surveyed have some accelerators, typically GPUs, in their HPC AI systems. And 32% of their nodes have accelerators. So almost all the users, using at least some, and the 32% uh, of the HPC AI nodes are accelerated. And that is looking to, ra to rise here. We asked them what, you're going to, what that's going to look like in like two years. It's going up, going up to about 45%. So usage of accelerators, this and the upper right, accelerators per node is, is really interesting. Um, 
right now, in terms of broad usage, four is the biggest column that you see. And it's kind of a compromise from what we can tell in that four GPUs is probably too much for a lot of HPC applications. But four, in a lot of cases, isn't enough for AI, for machine learning. So I kind of get the feeling that they're compromising at four. And we're seeing increasing numbers for six, eight, ten or more. Um, so that, that's going to remain a big hot button in the market. And my feeling is, from what I've looked at, is that some of the server vendors are not hitting the numbers that they hoped for, not because demand isn't there. Demand is there. It's because they can't fulfill their orders because they can't get accelerators. And again, typically GPUs, if you take a look, right, that um, the GPUs, NVIDIA GPUs, 2021, 91.7% of our surveyed market. Last survey, 86.9% are NVIDIA. In the future, you take a look there, they're gonna dip all the way down to 79%, which isn't very low. But there is room for growth if only AMD could produce more. They're gonna sell every single GPU that they can produce. They're gonna sell every single APU that they can uh, manu have manufactured. They just can't have enough manufactured to really dig in. Now, there's another thing too, I'm not sure I included it in this deck, but I was curious as to how sticky GPUs are. So, do customers know that there are packages out there that will allow them to translate CUDA over to AMD or Intel GPUs. And what I found is that customers are mostly not aware that things like Rockham and HIP and Sickle exist. They know one API exists, sure, but they don't know like Sickle that allows you to, to translate that CUDA code into something that could be understood by an Intel GPU. They didn't really know that a uh, rock or, or a rock or a hip exist for AMD GPUs. And of those that were aware, sort of investigating it, but not, it's a small number, I'm gonna say like probably 15% that are actually using it. So, CUDA is a big lock-in for NVIDIA, and that's what fuels these numbers, I think. This is interesting, too. Uh, I don't, I'm not aware that anybody else has ever researched this, and I've been doing it for a couple of years now. Because um, one of the things I was hearing anecdotally from customers is that, you know, they're not getting as much use out of the GPUs they have, the utilization rates, as they hoped. And so I actually asked three questions about it. And interestingly enough, uh, the second one, where we asked them if their GPUs are being, or their accelerators are being as highly utilized as they expected, 57% said no. They were expecting them to be used more. 25% uh, blamed that on their accelerators becoming sort of islands of compute that are siloed off and not easily accessible. This to me is saying that the composable infrastructure folks have a really good opportunity here. This is right in their wheelhouse. This is like the Giga IOs, the liquids, et cetera. This is, is something that they can address. And I think it was Giga IO that just announced at SC that they could attach 64 GPUs to a single node. Now you're going to have some, you're not, it's not going to be as fast as something directly connected, but you're still getting the 64 um, GPU acceleration and it's pretty scalable. They ran, uh, I think it was a uh, Linpack and HPCG on them 
And it was looking, I mean, those are very parallel, but it was good scalability. So I think those guys have a, a really good opportunity. Uh, system utilization had to fight Addison on this question. He said, all HPC systems and AI systems are utilized close to 100%. I said, no, they're not. He said, yeah, they are. So I'm going to ask it anyway. He said, oh, finally, he agreed. They're not. And it's really, I want to say, nearly impossible to fully utilize a very large supercomputer. Workloads are lumpy. They have different demands. You've got different uh, constituencies. You've got vastly different applications. But as the budget gets bigger, the utilization climbs. And I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, and the, the lower utilization comes with smaller commercial HPC AI users. Here's, this is a big deal. And I'm going to have probably some hand-raising opportunities here. Um, I, did some, I did a panel at SC recently concluded, a liquid cooling panel. And to do that, there were a couple of vendors that were sort of sponsoring it. And I had them send me their presentations so I could pull some data from it. I took a look at their charts of where energy consumption was going in servers. And they were too conservative. I looked at it and said, well, wait a minute, hold on. Let me see who's wrong here. So I went out and configured a system to you, two CPUs, and a couple of GPUs. If you take a look at the recent AMD Epic 9000 series power consumption, and you just average them, not looking at just the high SKUs with the huge core counts, average is 293 watts, right? Now, I'm remembering the days when 130 was a little bit high on a server processor. 293 watts and you need two of them, add in some memory, you got the motherboard, and that's just sort of rounding errors until you added the GPUs. And if you're going with the full-on NVLink GPUs, you've got a budget that those could use 700 watts each. And that's a lot. Just using two in the red, lower to left, you take a look at the numbers that I showed you before about the percentage of HPC nodes that have accelerators, right? And you take a look at it, we're gonna fill up a 42U rack. 36% of those nodes are gonna have two GPUs, sometimes four. I'm gonna use two to be conservative. The CPU nodes, which are the rest, that's 27 uh, slots in that, that alone is 19,000 watts, 19 kilowatts, 19 kW. You add in the 50 nodes that are using two GPUs in addition to that, that's another 31 kW. That total rack, 42U, you fill it up, is over 50 kW. How many of you can handle that right now in your data centers? Anybody? One. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. So this, this is Christmas. This is the father. We have Christmas future. This is what's coming down the road. And to me, it's, I, I don't think you could do this with air unless you're in the Arctic. Full open windows all the time and watch out for the condensation. You're going to have to use some kind of liquid cooling here, whether it's direct connect, and this becomes a pretty good argument for immersion because direct connect uh, gets, you're, start a, you're starting to sort of get to the top of its capabilities there. Uh, there's also, you know, two phase, there's other things out there and there's some things that are coming down the road, but this is, this is the future. So going to liquid cooling, we do see more folks going towards the fully uh, integrated chilled racks. 
Not enough. As you buy new systems, this is going to become what you have to do. Uh, 34% are saying they're going to increase uh, fully plumb plumbed racks. 36% say they're going to be decreasing air-cooled only. Door chillers, rear door chillers, they help, but they can't handle much above about 30 kW per rack. And you have to start adding some pretty cold liquid to it and chilling it to get there. There are folks out there that are in, in the liquid cooling business that say that you're going to end up with uh, direct connect you know, water blocks on your CPUs and GPUs plus a rear door chiller. It's getting hot. Uh, clouds. And we're a little, we kind of, we've kind of gone out on a limb, but it's led there by research. And this is a little bit of a busy slide. And by the way, these slides will be available. I'll, I'm fine with them being available. Um, if you're taking a look, the, the front boxes are what they're using today. The rear boxes are what they anticipate using. Um, and it's overall that right now, about 12% of the HPC AI workloads of the folks we surveyed are on a public cloud. They expect it, again, adding them all up, to go to about 22% of their workloads. Commercial is at 24% and they expect it might go as high as 31. That's, and that's, by the way, in five years. So that growth rate from 24% today in commercial to 31% in five years is pretty low. That's not the double digit growth rates, you know, high double digit growth rates that cloud has been experiencing. Where their growth is gonna come from is from academia who's not using much at all and from government that's using even less. Um, by budget size, the smaller you are, the, the more you're using cloud, which makes sense. But as those budgets get bigger, uh, the amount that you're using in public cloud gets smaller. And I think, we think, that we're going to see peak cloud penetration for HPC AI workloads to come within the next five years. And after that, uh, cloud, uh, cloud will grow for those workloads at about the same rate as the market and as the economy. It ain't all going to cloud. No, it doesn't make economic sense. I'm here for a week. Do I rent an apartment because I'm here for a week? No. Do I buy a house because I'm here for a week? No. Do I stay at a hotel? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I do. If I were in South Africa for six months, I'd probably rent an apartment. If I knew I was going to be here for six years, I'm going to buy a house because it's the right economic thing to do. A cloud is just a rented computer. And to me, clouds make sense in a lot of cases, public clouds. Number one, for overflow. When you're up to the stops in your data center and you need to have some capacity, absolutely. For urgent jobs that need to be done right away and maybe need some hardware that you don't have, like accelerators. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. To tire kick new hardware and develop for it that you don't have. Yeah, that makes sense. But the higher your utilization rate is and the demand for that cloud, the worse it gets economically. In a qualitative survey we did, we had I think 29 out of 30 that we talked to for about an hour, hour and a half each, say that they had done TCO studies they're on-prem versus public cloud, and they found it to be four to ten times more expensive. Which, you know, renting a hotel for a couple of years is a lot more expensive 
than a house payment for a couple of years. It makes sense. You're using someone else's thing. The other thing is that the more high performance you need out of a public cloud node, it goes up a lot more. You've got data ingress, you've got data egress. The other thing is that they found, and, and I believe it, that when you move an entire workload to the cloud, that doesn't mean you get rid of all the people. You still need your application people. You still need your storage specialist. You still need all of those expensive people that you have today. Now, who you can get rid of is like the high school kid or college kid that takes a wheelbarrow up and down your data center, pulls out the nodes that the lights have gone out on, throws it in the wheelbarrow, takes it to the loading dock, gets another one, slides it in. Them you can get rid of. But most of the rest, the large majority, are going to have to stay. I'm not against cloud, but I believe that as the bills come due, as they start to take a look at the budgets and how they're spending, that they're going to realize cloud is not a panacea. It's not an economic panacea at all. It's a rental car. It's an apartment. It's, or it's a hotel. Maybe an apartment. But it's, it's not something that's going to make IT less expensive. Okay. Uh, drivers and barriers, I'm not going to go through all of these, but what we're really finding here in the yellows are the agrees and the strong agrees. Uh, the big things that there are just certain HPC AI applications and data that you can't put out on a public cloud. You've, you've got to keep responsibility for it and locality for it due to regulations, due to confidentiality, things like that. Um, the other thing is that uh, next to the bottom, that a large majority agree that their cloud computing uh, resources that they're using, they're different, different purpose, different things they're doing than on-prem HPC AI and the expense thing that I just sort of beat to death. So we just, we did a um, market update. And we're going to start doing that every six months rather than once a year, a year with our forecasting because it's changing. It's changing really fast. We did our last um, machine learning survey, for instance, just before ChatGPT came out, which just threw it into disarray. And the generative AI has really brought some changes. Uh, the use of GPU has driven expenses up. Um, and so we, we believe, and that's in yellow, that we're seeing this we're kind of halfway into a spending bubble that is going to be short-lived but significant. Here's what it looks like. See that hump in the dark blue? That's the bubble. That's our revised forecast. It will slightly increase the long-term growth rate, but it's about an $8.5 billion bubble, which is significant. Now, let's take a look at what is driving it and what's dampening it eventually. That spending is up because, uh, largely because of this whole zeal for generative AI. I, I did some sessions at HPC on Wall Street and talked to a lot of folks, and there are CEOs out there that are telling, calling up their, their CIO and banging the table and saying, this AI stuff, get me some. Get it now. Bring it in. Got to have it. And then the CIOs are blindly going out and looking to get it and putting in orders and stuff like that. And that's why we're seeing, I, last I heard, this may not be right, but that NVIDIA had about a, between a 45 and 48 week lead time requirement for GPU purchases. Uh, I think AMD is probably not far off of that. Uh, so that is, is pushing up the spending. 
because those prices aren't coming down while there's that kind of demand. Uh, hyperscale and cloud, which accounts for 50% of worldwide IT purchases, that they are buying a slug of them. And you keep seeing the announcements. AWS has just added a billion H200s, even though it's not quite out yet. Google has just added two billion H5, uh, 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 you know, H100s, H500s, what have you. Um, so that is sucking up a lot of the inventory, plus all these startups you hear about that have suddenly have came out of nowhere and they've got an investment from NVIDIA and 10,000 GPUs, which is probably more, value, more valuable than the cash they put in. However, so that's pushing it up. What's bringing it down is going to be the eventual focus by organizations and companies and stuff on what this generative AI can do and what it can't do. There's going to be some tragedies and tears. We're going to have some, some train wrecks in companies sort of blindly adopting it, thinking that it's going to work miracles. Um, so that is going to cut down demand. We're also going to see an increase in GPU, accelerator supply, and more alternatives. I've been pitched by a number of, of companies that have some really promising approaches, and some that, you know, that, aren't, that uh, aren't invisible, like Cerebras. They're doing a, some big deals out there. Samba Nova, folks like that, and the, the scarcity of traditional GPUs is going to drive market for them and we're seeing it. I also believe that these new generations of LLMs, uh, machine learning, et cetera, is gonna be less computationally demanding. Just as we found out that doing machine learning at lower precision rates allow, makes it for a less computationally demanding task, we're gonna find that same thing in LLMs that you don't need the full trillion parameters to do your own LLM inside your data center. Um, that much, you know, much smaller models will get you 80, 90% of the way to what you perceive as perfection at a much lower cost and much lower time. Uh, the other thing, by the way, just to throw this in, that I believe that this generative AI and customized LLMs for organizations, I think that's going to drive on-prem, um, on-premise service uh, servers. It's going to it's going to need to be in the data center. It's going to be too vital, too critical, too jam-packed of competitive information to allow it to go outside your doors, outside your firewall. We'll see if that prediction comes true, but that's, that's what I think. So, what's next from us? Some of you in this room may have received emails from me saying, hey, come do this software survey. It's a really good survey. I mean, from your standpoint, it's going to be really good because it's going to drill down into the actual 12 different domains with actual software packages underneath. It's going to be hell on earth for me to compile it. But you only answer questions about things you select. Me, I'm going to go through about 950 columns on Excel to put it together. But it's going to give some great data. I don't know that anybody has gone this in-depth into HPC and AI software. And I'm regretting almost the day I was born when I started designing this. But it's done, it's up, and we would love to have you participate. Uh, we also have the 2024 Winter Classic Student Cluster Competition. Uh, 12 teams from historically black and Hispanic universities starts in January, runs through April. Um, this is a lot of fun, and yeah, you know, it's inspiration from like Happy starting his own competition that caused me to start my own competition. Uh, we have um, industry mentors. HPE is one. Uh, Oak Ridge, NASA, Google, AWS. And what it means to be a mentor is for one week, you have all 12 teams working on your clusters provided from your data center on an application that you as the mentor 
has selected. And then they work, work, work on it, ask questions. Saturday, 3 p.m., my time, Pacific time, you turn, the team's turning their best and final answers. And then as you can see here on the right, we have a studio update show where we reveal the leaderboard. Who did well? Who needs to work a little bit harder? But the thing that I really like about this competition, the way it really works out, completely even uh, level playing field. The teams all receive the same instruction, have the same opportunity to ask questions. They got the same hardware. So it's really based on just what they want to put into it. And we're looking for sponsors. Become a sponsor, get associated with this, become a sponsor of the Studio Update Show. It's great publicity, great stuff. Okay, that's enough for the commercial. Thank you. I don't think I have any time for questions and answers. Catch me later, I'll be around. I'm easy to find, send me an email. We now have a special event. Are you ready? This is gonna get, this is gonna get ugly. Analyst Crossfire. Students, come on up. We're gonna mix things up this year. Here's the rules. We're gonna have eight vendors. We're going to let them use three slides. And by the way, some of you vendors, and I'll call you out as I remember you, come on in, have a seat on the far side of that table. Three slides. You submitted five. You submitted seven. One of you tried to get away with using builds to where you actually had like 12 slides. I fixed that. You're down to three now. Anyway, this is going to be fun. Uh, they get three slides. They have five minutes maximum presentation time, which will be strictly enforced. They're going to face three questions, two from me and one from the student section. Maybe two from the student section if you guys come up with good ones, right? Or if I come up weak. And at the end, you're going to select the vendor that did the best in terms of their presentation and handling whatever we throw at them. So, Dell Technologies, come on up. Are you ready? I gotta get the clock out. No. Uh, We've got this mic over here. Let's put that one back. You got your clicker. Is that on? That's on? Get comfortable. Thank you, Dad. This will be the last time you'll be comfortable on this stage. <laughs> thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you, folks. Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Ryan Rotenbach. I'm an advisory systems engineer, Dell Technologies. and. Uh, topic I chose for my five minute discussion today actually leads quite nicely into what Dan's been talking about today. So uh, I'm here to talk about the evolution of HPC and what we've seen over the past few years. So um, starting at the, the right hand side, the traditional side of HPC where we uh, focused quite largely on uh, the, the weather forecasting and oil exploration as an example. Um, then moving into the more data-centric side of things, uh, as we've evolved through through the HPC, where we started doing the gen gen uh, genome sequencing, financial modeling, and uh, even the signal processing. And over the last few years, Damn we've you seen might. this convergence of high-performance computing and data analytics coming together into what we've termed HPDA, so the high-performance uh, data analytics arena. and. Uh, as uh, Dan alluded to, the whole new workload that's coming into HPC around the generative AI side of things. So AI, um, specifically around machine learning and deep learning, and with our new workload being Gen AI in the deep learning space, um, that's uh, part of the evolution of where HPC's come from and where it's moving into. And I also think it'll be the stepping stone to being able to uh, interact and engage with quantum computing coming up in the future as well. So AI is not new to us at Dell. Um, it's something that we've worked on for decades. Uh, we actually have this four-tier uh, strategy in Dell. We talk about AI in, AI on, AI for, and AI with. 
And what we mean by that is the AI in is where we're actually taking uh, AI and building that into our technologies and solutions, um, making it uh, uh, help us get deeper insights into, into the technologies that we're providing. Um, uh, AI on is where we actually develop the design, validated designs or reference architectures to be able to take uh, HPC and AI workloads and run them on these systems. Um, AI4 has two bits to it, so AI4 we, we focus on, on making it easier for customers to engage with Dell technologies, but very largely we actually use it for our own internal use and, and success. We have a, a team of data engineers and data scientists that see how they can improve our applications and our uh, um, workflows within Dell to make us more efficient and, and, and ready for the future, if you like. And then AI with um, is probably the, the, the key thing to this all. Um, it's actually using the ecosystem, um, our partnerships with the likes of NVIDIA, Intel, AMD, um, and recently even a, a few new, new partnerships with the likes of, of companies like Hugging Face, where we can take um, pre-trained open source models and make them available on premise for customers to utilize the likes of ChatGPT with your own corporate data. Um, and putting the guardrails and all the good things in place to be able to for, uh, you know, enable customers to do that. Um, so not to take up all my time, uh, we're a worldwide organization and we have H HPC and AI centers of excellence around the globe, CHPC being one of them. Um, but uh, my task or uh, my ask from you is to engage with us. Um, you know, we have AI experts, we have HPC experts, we actually have the HPC and AI Innovation Lab, which is where our students went last year, that, 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 uh, our Springbok students, if you like, where they went and had the chance and opportunity to engage with our experts, get real, real hands-on um, work and actually figure out how these uh, all fit together. So that's my ask to you today. Please engage with us and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys throughout the week. Um, and yeah, have a great conference. Thank you, everybody. Great job. You're 50, you're, get back up there. You're still going. Oh, okay, that's points off. But you are 58 seconds under time. That points get replaced. Good job. And we're going to keep this moving because I think I went too long. So quickly, what's your real differentiation here? Because you... These slides could have been shown by others. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, I kept it high level to keep in the five minutes. Yeah. Uh, we will be deep diving into this on Thursday in the vendor breakout session, so 11 o'clock. Come and see what we're doing with the likes of, of NVIDIA, where we have uh, generative AI uh, validated designs and reference architectures. They will deep dive and show you the building blocks of those. Okay, that leads to my next question that GPU supplies, particularly from NVIDIA and AMD, they're kind of crippling sales. It's really tough on customers. What alternatives are you working with that you can help customers with, perhaps? That's a good question. That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> that was more for my other mate I was going to defer to. Like, That's a hard question. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, it has been a challenge, and I think even from COVID, we started experiencing chip challenges in the networking space. Um, we have got really long lead times, and, and even certain uh, the GPUs just going off the market because they've been sold out and not being manufactured any further. So it is a bit of a trick. I think as Dell, we're fairly lucky, as I said, we've got an ecosystem of partners. So we are working with the likes of Intel and AMD with their, their GPUs in our system, so there are alternative offerings. Um, we have a few partners in the FPGA space, so depending on what your workload use case is, uh, we try and right size and get a solution that would work for you within the time frames that you've got mapped out. So it's not, a, it's not an easy answer. <laughs> I'll ask again next year, because there's some alternatives that are out there that would be helpful. Okay, we're going to go to the Council of Students. What's your question? Who's got one? Pass the mic down, please. So, should be on. Yeah, you're good. So, oh, you're better than good. <laughs> Apologies. 
So as a student, the word open source made my ears prickle up. When you speak about using an open source AI model, what are you adding to that as a service that is then making it no longer free for a student like myself to use? Hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> By the way, I primed these students on the 30 minute drive over. That was there. more of a Dan question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the good question, Jono. Um, Look, open source, I think there's, there's also an illusion that open source is free, um, especially when you're doing it in a corporate uh, and an enterprise scale. Um, there's a lot to open source that's not free. I think our advantage is um, working with companies like Hugging Face, where they've done all the open source work. We're literally providing on-premise infrastructure. So op Hugging, Hugging Face is a cloud-based uh, um, infrastructure that you can go and, and do your AI models on where our corporate and, and enterprise customers have a lot of uh, IP in their data that they can't necessarily put out in the cloud. So bringing those open source models on premise and being able to put the guardrails on for them to be able to use that on premise is kind of the focus, um, but we'll still do it as cost effective as we can. Not free, but as cost effective as we can. Okay, good job, good question, thank you. Moving right along, Intel. Here's your clicker. Your time starts very soon. Go ahead, you're on. Hello. Good afternoon. I feel myself like a rock star. <laughs> it's not as much fun as you think. So, my, name, my name is Ahmed. Uh, uh, I am the regional head for HBC and AI at Intel Corporation. I come from the Middle East and the African region. So. Oh, I, I just have to make a quick note here. This will not come out of your time. Some of you vendors who submitted more than three slides, I did a little editing. Also, any animations and builds and stuff are gone too. So what you see up here is going to be maybe slightly different than what you submitted. So enjoy that. Yeah. Yours were good. You were fine, Dell was good, yeah. So we see at Intel that the industry needs to solve three main challenges in the HPC and the AI space. The first one is sustainable HPC at scale. So we all know that when you train a large language model, you will, uh, there will be five million tons emitted of carbon dioxide. That is equivalent to around 60 megawatt, which is equivalent to 1,000 houses over six years. It's a lot that we are doing to harm our planet, and we need to fix that. And as, as at Intel, we are trying to address one this problem. The second thing is the software part, the software ecosystem. As Dan probably mentioned, okay, there is CUDA, HEP, C++, ROC, and many others. Okay, so what we are trying to do is to make it as a standard. So we established one API. One API is an open standard body, and there is one implementation of one API that Intel provides, or SQL based, that can run the same code you can run on NVIDIA GPUs, on Intel CPUs, on AMD CPUs, on AMD GPUs. So basically, uh, it's a single source code that you need to maintain that you can run everywhere. Of course, you need to recompile, obviously. Okay, I'll come to that in more detail. So that is one of the challenges, the software part, and how you optimize that software. The third one is the compute itself. Because now, we de more than any time in the history, we demand much more compute. Uh, large language models, AI, the emergence of HPC simulations. It's getting more and more demanding. And part of it is definitely is the compute and how to have a balanced system to compute memory bandwidth and I/O. So quickly, what we offer in this space, just quick uh, overview of what we offer. If you look at this, okay, today we are shipping the fourth gen Xeon. Okay, December fourteenth, we will launch the fifth gen Xeon with really good performance enhancements on 4th gen. Uh, and definitely next year we are on track to ship the next gen Xeon. 
uh, uh, which will be maybe Gen 6, we don't know. And in terms of accelerators, Habana Gauti 2 is already shipping, which is a deep learning accelerator. It is only specialized in deep learning. It doesn't do regular graphics or GPU or anything else, or HPC workloads. It is only deep learning AI training and inference. It's really good. And in terms of price performance, we have seen it beating any other accelerator in the market. Gaudi 3 is coming mid next year. And finally, we've got our own GPU as well that we are already shipping. Uh, called uh, Intel Max Data Center Max GPU that you can get from the market and trust me in terms of supply we are really good. What do I go? Yeah. Yep. So the final slide I just wanted to put a bit more focus on one API. As I said, one API is the open standard yep. and we have our own implementation. One minute and we have our own implementation in one API. This implementation as well. Yep. Go back, yeah. This implementation as well, okay, takes care of the conversion from CUDA to SQL. Okay, so you can use our own converter that converts your code up to 90%, 95% from CUDA to SQL. So with that, thank you very much for listening. I hope you liked it. And probably if you need any question, we are in the booth anytime. And I'm doing Good job. Keynote. Good job. Thank you very much. Okay, stay there. Uh, my question: I don't think that Intel messaging has been very clear with Gaudi. It's a great chip. If the first one was good, the second one's good, third one will probably be good. But then it was announced that it's not going to stay into. It's going to be blended into this Falcon Shores thing. If I buy Gaudi today. Am I going to be supported later on, or is my investment kind of whiskey? Actually, I, I agree with you. We have been confusing our customers. No, your investment is not risky. Uh, Falcon Shore will be backward compatible with both Gaudi and uh, Pontifex. Okay. So one API will be the standard uh, for Falcon Shores, but it will support backward compatibility with the Gaudi. If I were you, I would be yelling that over and over and over. I agree. Uh, actually, it's, it's, this is one of the feedback we give our marketing team during supercomputing. Okay, All good. All our customers give us similar feedback. Good, good, good. So, uh, you talked about Sickle, and it's kind of recent news to us. You haven't been talking about it much publicly at all. What kind of performance can you see in the real world converting CUDA to Sickle? Yeah, we did that. Actually, we did. Uh, if I had time, I'll show you the slide. Okay, we have performance numbers publicly available. Okay, that shows Sickle, uh, actually CUDA running on NVIDIA hardware and Sickle running on NVIDIA hardware. The variance on most workloads is around within 5% plus minus. Can I convert, I'm sneaking in another question, can I convert using Sickle in uh, CUDA code to run on AMD GPUs? You, yeah, actually the Sickle code can run on AMD GPUs, yes. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Student council, what do you got? Hello, how are you? Um, so you talked about uh, reducing uh, emissions in the beginning, uh, but could you elaborate on the roadmap uh, you followed in improving energy efficiency, uh, especially considering the increase in demand for uh, power efficient solutions as presented by Dan earlier on? Absolutely. So let's take the difference between third gen Xeon and fourth gen Xeon. The third gen Xeon is 270 watt maximum. The fourth gen is 350 watt maximum. So that is a big, big jump. jump huh? However, let's look at performance numbers. We introduced what we call AMX, for example. That's just one example. AMX and Xeon that boosts the inference uh, performance by 10x. So the delta is different. Uh, and in terms of, for example, number of cores, the 27 uh, watt is maximum. Uh, 40, no, not even 40, 30 something cores, 28 cores actually. The 350 watt is 56 cores. 
Okay, so we are nearly doubling the number of cores again. And in terms of HPL, you can, I don't recall the numbers that on top of my head, but it is nearly double, uh, less than double as well. Okay, so basically we are increasing the performance at a rate faster than increasing the power. So this is how we consider sustainability and performance per watt. Good, okay, well great, well thank you very much. Good job. You. You're welcome, thank you. Huawei. Where's our Huawei? Here you come, good. Are we having fun so far? Is this good? We moving fast enough? We're trying to keep it going. This is fun though. Welcome. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is PK Maragalla. Um, I would like to put a disclaimer out there that I am not an expert in HPC. I am actually an expert in networks IP. So I'm just putting it out there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Granted. We will treat you as if you're an expert in HPC and AI. <laughs> so I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what um, Huawei offers as a enterprise business. So we've got three um, pillars under our, under our portfolios. Um, we've got your consumer business, which um, involves your consumer devices like your smartphones, wearable, um, smart home devices, um, telematics, and we've got your career business, which is your MTN, your Telcom and Vodacom, all the backbone of our telco um, networks. Um, the, the core infrastructure is our DWM um, equipment, which is why most of the networks right now you see as efficient and reliable. Um, that's because of our equipment, thank you. And we've got the enterprise business that, is, that focuses on your connectivity for your enterprise connectivity, which is your wireless infrastructure, your enterprise network, which consists of your security, it consists of your um, switching environment, routing environment, and so forth. Then we've got your cloud business, which consists of your computing, which is your public uh, cloud and your hybrid cloud, which um, to yesterday and today we've been focusing on um, HPC, on storage facilities and servers. We also do um, focus on that, but fortunately I cannot talk much more on that, like I stated earlier on. And there are four reasons for selecting um, Huawei as a um, cloud campus, which is we are a leader in Wi-Fi 6, and right now we have um, developed um, solutions that are currently on Wi-Fi 7. It's a pity that um, we in South Africa do not, haven't rolled out um, Wi-Fi 7 as yet, but we have solutions um, that caters for Wi-Fi 7. Um, we are number one in the optical communications um, tech, um, technology. We've got a hybrid cable um, that combines your fiber and copper cable into one cable, meaning that now you can be able to process power and um, data on one single cable. Then we've got your net engine series routers. We are number one market share globally, um, which consists now of your, it integrates your um, 5G three times industry performance, meaning that it's one of the fastest um, routing devices that you can find out there. And then we've got your intelligent operation and maintenance, um, which is proven in a global campus worth 190,000 plus users, um, meaning that we've got a, a, um, a management system that incorporates artificial intelligence, meaning that it can be able to manage your, um, your entire um, campus network, whether it's your wired infrastructure, data center, cloud infrastructure, it gives you a complete analytics on what is traversing through your entire network and it can give you um, artificial intelligence like if um, a storage server has gone offline, it gives you the possible cause why it went offline, how to fix it, um, it gives you guided remediation unlike now you spending a lot of um, time troubleshooting and finding where the issue is. So this is our intelligence um, management system which gives you zero weight network which is um, automatic management. It gives you um, automatic artifi artificial intelligence and segmenting within your infrastructure. Zero risk terminals and zero interruptions applications meaning that you can basically 
improve your network um, by planning your um, configurations um, and deployment more efficiently using our systems. Thank you very much. Great, good job. Okay, uncharacteristically, I'm gonna take it easy. You are not an HP CAI expert. You got thrown to the wolves here. And I got a feeling you didn't do these slides either. I got a feeling these slides got thrown at you too, right? Okay, enough said. So, and thank you for being a sponsor. That's great. You did already pay the check, right? They've already gotten it. Happy you get your check from them? Okay, good. So, uh, is Huawei planning or do you, are you thinking about offering any HPC AI specific services or offerings that you know of? I'm quite not sure of that. Um, we've got our expert coming in tomorrow, which will be giving um, a presentation. Maybe one of the um, audience guys can give um, that particular question. Um, him, but I'm not quite too sure, so I don't want to give an, an answer which I'm not sure. Understand. Students, what do you got? I'm only going to ask one. Um, hi. Um, my question is, I see all this Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 7, zero data, but then my question is, how do we actually, how does our communities actually benefit from all this? What does this have to do with our communities at home, our mothers and stuff? What, how does this have to do with them? So, so as well, we, we have um, incorporated um, um, projects across South Africa. For example, um, at Etiquini, um, we have rolled out public Wi-Fi um, to the villages, to the stadiums, public areas where everybody can be able to access the internet with no issues. Meaning that um, we are in the process now of educating adults. We are in the process of educating those people that do not know how to use the internet so that they can be able to communicate with our government entities, to log queries with them, tell them about the services that are working and that are not um, working. So as Huawei, we, we are having projects where we are rolling out um, um, internet connectivity um, to public um, hotspots so that we can connect all villages together. Great, thank you very much. Good job. Okay, next, NVIDIA. Oh, thank you. NVIDIA, your clicker. I can also be the non-HPC person, I'll just skip all the questions. Oh, no, we're just gonna rip you harder. No, no, no. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. You're NVIDIA, you don't get a break. <laughs> You didn't give me a break on the last GPUs I bought. Anyway, go ahead. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. It's good to see you all. I was about to say, I thought I was actually going to be the last one. Don't stop my five minutes yet. I thought I was going to be the last one. I was going to be standing between you and the Boma bra, but it's, uh, <laughs> it seems we've got one or two others still to come, so I can't use that excuse. Uh, my name's Claudio Apollo. I'm the Senior Country Sales Manager for NVIDIA. Um, and I'm going to speak to you about accelerated computing and sustainability. So two really hot topics, pretty much a very good theme of what Dan was uh, discussing. So accelerated computing is, in essence, a full stack problem, right? And it needs a coordinated, innovative approach at every single layer. So to start off with, we have our amazing hardware. GPUs, CPUs, DPUs, and all of these products are embedded in either a server or an edge device and are available at the edge, on-prem, or in the cloud. We've also got our NVIDIA Mellanox networking, which is the nervous system that connects this accelerated computing to this new, well, the accelerated data center to this new currency of compute, this new unit of compute. On top of that, you've also got the SDKs and frameworks, okay? And this is where researchers, developers, scientists can develop and progress their, uh, the next generation uh, of compute, etc. okay? 
So to give you an example of some of the um, some of the frameworks, you've got Holoscan, which is a medical AI streaming framework. Okay, and this is for edge devices, so for surgical as well as for medical and scientific edge devices. You've got Nemo framework, which is a large language model uh, framework for large data sets, and this allows you to um, at supercompute type levels, okay, um, to be able to establish and develop the next foundation models. We've also got HPC, our HPC SDK. This is where all of the SDKs inside of our HPC allows scientists and researchers there again to go and develop out HPC community-based frameworks and enhance them and customize them. We've also got Omniverse, which is our collaborative open ecosystem. Um, and this is a, it's more from a visual perspective. So it allows um, consumers to develop products for visualization. So a big use case for this that, I, that has actually come out is digital twins, which is very, very key um, in creating, simulating reality with a virtual product. Um, and right down to scale as well. And then we've also got quant uh, CUDA Quantum, or Q Quantum, which is our framework for quantum computing. Um, and together with CUDA Quantum, the programming language, allows these researchers and developers to progress and accelerate um, the next level of quantum computing. HPC is constantly reinventing itself, and what we're starting to see is that the next key focus is to maximize um, scientific, scientific discovery per energy unit. Um, NVIDIA's, NVIDIA's got on our web page, on our sustainability web page, we've got numerous use cases. We use it, you know, you can actually go in and have a look at these use cases and you can see the commitment that we've made to sustainable computing. Um, whether it be from data science to digital twins, fluid dynamics to computational lithography, it gives massive, massive reductions in terms of our actual energy as well as lowering costs. From a total, you know, from an accelerated computing stack perspective, currently today we've got 3,000 NVIDIA GPU accelerated apps. Uh, there's, four, there's over 4.5 million developers uh, currently contributing to our ecosystem. 20 uh, seconds. Sorry. 20 seconds. <laughs> And then from a, from a uh, if you look at it from 26, slide's gone a bit funny, but from 2016 yeah. when we introduced our P100, right up to today, we've had about a 27x increase in GPU performance. In retrospect, that is about 250 times the performance increase over a dual Broadwell CPU server. So a massive increase perspective. And the contribution to HPC, so 76% of the top 500 supercomputers out there either run our GPUs, networking, or a combination of both. And we're constantly driving um, in, the, in, in the green 500 uh, top computers as well. So 16 out of 20 of those are currently powered on NVIDIA with the number one uh, currently powered on the H100s. I got to stop you. I let you go over because I didn't give you enough notice. Okay. Here's the thing, this is going to be an uncomfortable question. I, my opinion, observing stuff, NVIDIA seems to be backing away from HPC in favor of AI. You don't sponsor, you sponsored this, which is great. You don't have a booth at ISC and haven't for a couple of years. You didn't really have much presence at the last SCs. And when I was walking to a meeting, I did see Jensen Wang at SC. It was on a big TV screen of Microsoft's because he was keynoting their event. Any thoughts? Uh, so, I think what's happened, you know, in, in most recent times, I think what's happened with um, NVIDIA is that I think we've been incredibly stretched um, just in terms of, if you look at the OEM ecosystem, you look at the partners, there is just so much for us. I mean, I, I don't think it's a case of we not focusing on HPC. We very much are focused on HPC. 
Um, if anything, we're bolstering up the stack even more to address it. But I think there's going to be quite a collision between the HPC and the AI. So from a scientific, you know, it's not just going to be just AI. There's going to be quite a collision between the two. Um, and the full stack kind of represents it. Okay. We'll watch this space. Who do you see as your biggest competitors coming down the road? I, to be fair, it's always a difficult one because, as I said at the start, accelerated computing is, it's not just, you know, the GPU is a component, but it's the sum of all parts. It's about the GPU, it's about the support, it's about the software, it's about the frameworks. And getting these all to synchronize together correctly, um, I think is, is, is where the total package lies. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's difficult to get support uncoherently between you know, a vendor and a software product that they don't support, et cetera. True, it's a good answer, so you're it's, right. It's difficult to say who, who's going to be, anybody could be a competitor. It's an ever-changing landscape. Everyone is a competitor. <laughs> Only the paranoid survive, there which go. is good, yeah. Students, what do you got? And speak into the mic really well, good. So, that's good. We've just said that the GPU is the center of everything. Pivoting off that onto what you said earlier about a quantum framework, is NVIDIA, geared towards actual quantum hardware, or is it simply simulation packages, or is it going to be using a different company and probable competitor's hardware to do so? Good question. Wow. Um, at current, so the Q-Quantum Q -quantum and CUDA Quantum are both um, development frameworks. Um, so they're SDKs, ultimately. Um, they, you know, companies or developers can come in and develop uh, quantum computing algorithms and customizations according, you know, on the frameworks. So it's not, as far as, as, far as us actually developing for something for quantum computing, that's, uh, that's without my reach, I can't. It's in a slide that says, you can't read that. <laughs> okay, well thank you very much, good job. <laughs> Spectrologic, gonna have to nail you on this. You guys gave me the builds. I took them all out. You were trying to get 12 slides into a three slide rule. <gasps> but I do like how you've just taken that. That's good, that's good. Welcome. So hi everyone, my name is Miguel Castro. I am a Solutions Architect Manager for Spectrologic. Um, this looked a lot different. <laughs> um, the idea is we're here all today looking at uh, HPC and high performance computing and cloud computing and you know the front end of this amazing uh, uh, workflow. But I'm here to talk about arguably the sexiest part of this entire uh, environment, which is storage and tape and how we preserve <laughs> this data for long term retention, enabling collaboration across multiple entities, multiple uh, environments. How do we bridge legacy file systems? Well, I call them legacy file systems. Um, POSIX file systems and, and, and uh, uh, network attached file systems and storage and allow users and organizations to collaborate and share that data. So what we've done is traditionally we build uh, tape libraries ranging from you know, your entry level uh, 6U unit to 44 frames um, storing well over uh, an exabyte and we have the, the largest library deployed in the world. But more importantly now, we're wrapping around software um, that allows, like I've mentioned, the, the uh, applications and, and data that already exists to uh, these organizations and research centers to create a platform where data can be shared, can be monetized, um, always with the objective of keeping that data for longer periods of time um, with no limitations. So the, really the solution, Veil, is this on-prem cloud and it's a solution that we deployed here at CSIR. They have a big library behind it with this S3 connect connector on top that allows them to connect to virtually any other environment and allows any S3 application to look at that data uh, and, and process that data locally or um, in, in other environments. It also allows a collaborative approach whereby CSIR can present the, the storage environment as, as, as a, you know, a true backup, scalable, uh, long-term preserving 
uh, appliance that will stay here long before we're gone and ensures that the data that we're developing and, and, and creating today um, gets used uh, in the future. So this also allows any organization that belongs to this infrastructure to uh, share data regardless of where they are in the world. So there's no geographical limitation to this environment. Um, it allows a global management console so everybody sees the data, depending on the permission, of course, that they need to see. So data that is created here in South Africa, maybe some, some researchers in Tokyo or Los Angeles need access to that data and based on that policy they get immediately vis immediate visibility of that data and they can share data back and forth in a secure manner, um, always with, with the, 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 the visibility of keeping that data, sharing it and creating a true collaborative approach um, regardless of where data sits, what protocol is used, what technology is used. And, uh, and hopefully keeping it for many years on tape. Thank you. Great, good job, good job. And I gotta say, at three minutes and 16 seconds, you're a hero. I was gonna say, I good love job. Your, your research on the clouds and the TCOs uh, and comparing you know, on-prem versus that, that's something that uh, we're, we're here to help with. Oh, good, well. good, good. Uh, you need to subscribe to our service then. So, yeah, we'll, we'll work that out. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I do have a question, though, relating to clouds. You're using the word glacier. You're using S3 in here. Are you mainly pitching kind of an AWS overlay? Excellent question. Yes or no? We use the same SDK as AWS. And the reason for that is we want to present this in, in, in a way that is compatible with most applications on the field. So from an application and user perspective, it looks and feels exactly like, like AWS does, but it's all on-prem. So it's like a, a least common denominator to make it simple for them yeah. since At they're probably... levels of Glacier, you can have it on-prem, in fact. But on-prem, okay. Uh, not just tape, a uh, hard drives too? Exactly. Whatever. The entire okay. infrastructure, yeah. I like that, actually. That's good. good That's answer. very cool. Yeah. Students, what do you got? Um, homework? You guys were working on homework? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, I'm still busy. Okay. But then let me just ask, uh, what is your core values on your data management approach and how you do so? What, is your, what, are, what are your values and principles? Of Excellent question. So again, the, the idea is to enable our users to look at the data regardless of what it is. One of the challenges that we see often in HPC environments is all of this data is created and it's really hard to find data sets. There's, the metadata exists but it's not indexed so I can't really go and specifically look for data sets. With this solution through the process that we call ingest we can look at uh, GPFS targets, any target really, and index that data and create with the ability of sidecars uh, append metadata to those files. That means that all of that research is now indexed, cataloged, and I can cherry pick different research, uh, uh, research uh, uh, data sets and compile them, compile them together in a project that I can use for my own research or share it. So there's a lot that we do to effectively look at the data, catalog it, add metadata to it, and, and really create this workflow that is transparent for everybody. That's a big deal. I wish you could do that Absolutely. on just my laptop even. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you. Good, yeah. That was a good one. Yeah. Super micro. Did you give me more than three slides too? No? Okay, okay. <laughs> Your time starts. They said, I got the invitation and they said five minutes. I said to my wife, how am I going to do a presentation in five minutes? She said to me, Roger, you should be quite accustomed to finishing in five minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. That was good. That, yeah. So, I'm, I'm actually, hold on. I'm going to pause your time. I'm going to reset it right now. <laughs> Boom. That was worth it. That was nicely done. Tell your so, wife. So the other thing Big I must say, up. I'm also definitely, I've only been in the industry for 12 months, so I'm a newbie. So please, like with my colleague, just go, go easy, gentlemen. Easy. Yeah. Um, right. So Supermicro is a manufacturer of hardware, right? We manufacture, we're a global manufacturer of server and storage hardware. 
We started the business in 1993. Charles Wang is the founder of the business. He is still the CEO. He's an engineer. So he's still extremely hands-on in the business. And he should be very proud of, of the fact that in the last 20 years we've been uh, sort of the global growing IT business. If you have a look at our share price, it'll tell you something very, very similar. Um, where he prides himself and we follow in that pride is the fact that we, we, we strive to be first to market in a lot of the, the ingenuity that we come with. So when our ecosystem of partners, the likes of NVIDIA, the guys that really do the brain work of the hardware, NVIDIA, Intel, AMD, who we work extremely closely with, when they're telling us where the industry is going and what your, as the user's requirements are, we strive to meet those requirements before the launch date. So we've got cases, we've got, for example, if you have a wonderful motor engine in a car, we build a body to accommodate the heat generated by that engine. We accommodate, if you want to put two motors in, we're the guys that go and manufacture that body to encase the engine of the motor car. The other thing that we, we are very proud of is that we are we strive to be very green in everything that we manufacture. Uh, we've, we, in fact, are very proud to be a part of the, the greenest data center in the world in Japan, and the green 500 data centers or something that I'm told. We were very proud to be a part of that manufacture process. So that is something that we pride ourselves on. Uh, we pride ourselves on, and Charles is very strong on green and very strong on power per watt. On, on being able to offer customers uh, return on the investment in terms of TCO, but also what is the impact on the environment. So he thinks he's telling us to sell, 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 so that he can retire from Supermicro and go and work for the Green Council, because he wants to plant trees in, in the desert. They've got a plan to plant trees in the desert, and he tells us that every Monday when he speaks to us, while everyone else is out golfing, I'm in a meeting at 7 o'clock on a Monday night. Thank you so much. <laughs> Working for an American business is fantastic. How do we change the thing? Oh. There you go. So in terms of our offering is from the data center in full open rack solutions in the data center, but right across to the, to the edge is where we will manufacture bodies for the engines, right? Whatever you need, whether it be in uh, one, one use, right up to eight use, we pride ourselves in being able to manufacture housings that can accommodate the requirement that you guys might have. And whether it be in enterprise, whether it be in the edge, and obviously for occasions like this in accelerated computing, we pride ourselves in being a leader in that space. And the stats that, that, that we were shown earlier shows that we're growing in that, in that space. If we looked at this five or six years ago, we would have been a bit further behind in terms of the amount of hardware that's been sold. And coming to the end, so there are for example, CERN in Switzerland, uh, the, the uh, European Nuclear Research uh, uh, Organization, uh, has we're very proud to say we're a part of that in terms of our hardware. There's a lot of international organizations that are using Supermicro, needless to say, but we're also proud to show some of the logos of South African organizations and African organizations, because we're very proud to be a part of the cloud that we've done at the this, at this CHPC, that's, that's our product, we're very proud to build. A lot of the universities that are building their own little HPC stacks are using our product because the, the, the return on investment, pound for pound, is very, very good. So please, folks, when you start looking at your investment, if you start talking about investing on behalf of your customers, please give Supermicro an opportunity. Otherwise, you may not be given the best opportunity pound for pound. Give it an opportunity. We manufacture great stuff. We brand very, very poorly. So if you don't know Supermicro, it's not because we don't do good stuff. It's because we don't brand very well. We're trying to improve on that. And the last thing I want to say is just thank you very much to everybody for this opportunity. It's been a privilege for me to be at the first uh, conference. This is my first time I've been here, so it's very great to be in a room with so many doctors. It's, I haven't been in a room with so many doctors since my baby was born. So <laughs> that's amazing. But what I would like to say is the following, folks. You've got eight seconds. How many seconds? Eight seconds. Eight seconds. Yeah. Can I just ask that we use this information to make a difference in our country? There are impoverished people that need all of our American and Chinese money, 
and the brains in this room to make a difference to the impoverished people of our country. Otherwise, all of this is just talk and rah-rah, unless it makes a difference. And in three years' time, when I come back, what we should see is a presentation on the difference that's coming out of this ingenuity, coming out of AI, to the people. Otherwise, it's just people, the, the rich getting richer, and the, nothing's happening for the poor. So please, let's use the power and the money in this room to okay. make a difference in our country. Thank I gave you extra time for that. And this is, this is your first time here? Excuse me? This is your first time here? Yes, sir. Has it been a good time? It's been awesome. Okay, that ends now. Um, <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. So, liquid cooling? I, huh? I asked, I asked to, be, to, go, to be kind on me, eh? But carry on. Many ask. Few yes. receive. So, what do you do with liquid cooling? Can I configure liquid cooling right out of your, off your website? Jy sien, nou, dis is a belangrike saak hierdie wat jy nou begin te praat. <laughs> so, as ons hierdie saak nou gaan mooi ondersoek nie, sal jy sien dat die antwoorde lê op die website, en ons doet baie goeie liquid cooling uh, solutions. Ja. <laughs> Thank you very little for that. So, okay. So, so, liquid cooling is a very big part of our roadmap. Uh, whether it be uh, cold plate cooling, we have, and we manufacture ourselves. One of our differentiators in terms of what Supermicro do is we manufacture right through to rack solutions and yep. including cooling. As you may and that's going to include liquid cooling. Absolutely. So immersive cooling, cold plate cooling is all. We have got solutions at the moment. We're building factories for that. Yeah. So it's, we understand that's where the industry, the industry is telling us that's where it's going. So we're manufacturing and building plants to be able to accommodate that as we speak. Sounds to me it might be you ought to buy somebody. But anyway, aside from that, now, how big a deal can you pull off going direct? I mean, you're still in a different category than a Dell or an HPE or an Eviden or a Fujitsu or someone like that. I don't get the sense Supermicro has built the domain knowledge yet. To do what? Sorry, what's the... To like, to like put in an HPC installation. Well, if you just have a look at CERN in Switzerland, go and have a look. That'll tell you everything about what Supermicro can do in terms of HPC. CERN will pretty much tell you exactly 100%. what they need and how they need it. Not every customer can do that. Fair enough. If you just have a look at the amount of engineers mm -hmm. that Supermicro have employed in the last 24 months, uh, in this space, we've got the, we have the onboard expertise that we've employed, and I think it's the number is like 600 people, just in terms of research and development and designing, and in the engineer space for HPC and obviously for AI. Okay. Go, go look at those stats. Don't, yeah, I'm just and I'm going I'm too deep into this, but I, I mean, what I wonder is where's your your expertise in complex financial derivatives? that use a lot of HPC systems in physics, in geophysics. No, sure. That I can't answer. That's, that's about my program, by about yeah. three times. You're going to need it to go into the markets that they're in. No, sure. 100%. Okay. Okay. Students, what do you got? Bonjour. Maintenant, je veux parler français avec toi. Touche. Touche. Yes. A, a little bit of your Nicely done. Touche. <laughs> Cool. Uh, so I just wanted to ask, um, what measures are in place uh, to guarantee continuous support, uh, updates, and maintenance for some of the products you've talked about as a small business or a bit smaller business compared to other guys here? Um, Twelve billion dollar business. Isn't they're it? actually they're pretty big. Yeah. They're like fourth or fifth well, in smaller service. than Nvidia. <laughs> well, not check the numbers. Close. But it's close. It may. So so how do we support? So. I think, I think reputation means a lot to any organization, uh, to any organization in the top four, uh, Fortune 500, reputation means a lot. So, and reputation is affected by support. So we, we, we care a heck of a lot about our support. We use a lot of partners to make sure that that support is, is and we make sure the training is right, we make sure that the people are in place, uh, we make sure, and in this country it's coming very soon, watch the space in terms of keeping spare holdings in the country, which we haven't done before. So all of that is coming. 
Um, but that, that, that's now uh, powerful, of course, in, in the US and in Europe in terms of support and in terms of uh, spares in the country. We care about our reputation, we care about what people say about our business, and therefore we care about uh, the support that we give uh, after sales service. And in terms of, we still, we've got uh, products that are out of warranty that we're still supporting if we need to, because our product is that good. Good job, thank you very thank much. You, good job. Okay, we're gonna get you to that barbecue. We are closing in on the final two, vast. I'd like to go ahead and point out that Vast has preceded the audience with applause, yeah, well, which is actually something to win. You know? It's a good move. Well, yeah. The time is yours. Excellent. So, great to be here in South Africa. My second time here, so um, great to be here. Uh, my name's Scott Howard. I'm from the office of the CTO team at Vast. So, I'm presuming Vast is a company that many of you have not heard of before. Um, we are a company that's actually been around for about eight years, um, building out a data platform. So think of us as a data storage company, now progressing into a data platform. Um, as I said, been around for around eight years, um, been shipping product for five. Uh, we've actually been in South Africa now via a partner for around two years, and have just recently opened a local office as well. Uh, as I said, we are a data platform company. Uh, really focused around um, HPC and AI as two of our sort of very popular use cases. And I'm sure you probably can't see most of the logos here on this slide, um, but there's a number of companies on here that are very much in the HPC space that are very large um, vast customers. Um, companies like Lawrence Livermore, National Labs, NASA Ames Research Centre, um, and you know, many others in that space. Uh, and very much now we're also um, building a very large footprint in the AI world, especially in the, the cloud AI providers such as uh, CoreWeave, Lambda, G42, um, those, you know, the companies that are now building out those very large AI clusters, as well as a lot of um, uh, enterprise AI and HPC deployments. So as far as what we actually do, uh, basically we built a new um, architecture for data storage. So, especially in the HPC world, um, you know, the, the products that people are using for storage are products that have been around for many years. They're products that were designed for hard disk and really a different world than the one we're living in at the moment. Um, so, we created a new architecture, basically splitting the, the logic and the storage levels uh, within our, our storage cluster, our storage array. And what this allows us to create is a product that can scale uh, independently between performance and capacity and allow us to you know, match an exact requirement for a system that's being built. And this is really where that power comes in and where we, you know, why we fit so well in a HPC world because we can scale to clusters that are um, hundreds of petabytes where they're needed uh, and or scale to systems that can produce, you know, hundreds, even um, hundreds of gigabytes per second or even into the terabytes per second worth of transfers, you know, as is needed. Uh, but we can do that independently because of the architecture and splitting the actual logic of the product and the, the data storage. As far as what this looks like to a, to a user, um, we don't use you know, any custom protocols. Everything that we present out of our product is a standard storage protocol. In the HPC world, that basically means NFS. Now, a lot of people in HPC, when you hear NFS, um, you know, it has a, a fairly bad reputation in the HPC world because NFS historically has not been a protocol that has worked well for HPC. But a lot has changed over the last few years. Not so much from the likes of the storage providers like us, but NFS itself has actually seen a lot of improvements that mean that it is now a protocol that scales far more than most people realise. And in fact, we can have systems running you know, well over 100 gigabytes per second uh, worth of traffic running from a single system uh, connected to one of our arrays over NFS. The advantage of that is that you don't need to be running custom client software on your HPC nodes. 
Uh, the simplicity of running a standardized process, uh, protocol uh, is so much easier than running you know, any of the, the standard self, uh, storage products that are used for HPC. We are also a multi-protocol array. So the data that's accessed over NFS can also be accessed over SMB uh, and or S3, which especially as we move more into the AI world um, is becoming more and more important. Uh, S3 in particular is a protocol that we're beginning to see, not so much in HPC, but certainly in AI workloads around the, the data flows that people are building, um, especially given that being a you know, scale-out, all-flash storage system. 20 seconds. We, we see a lot of people um, you know, storing all of their data on a vast system, avoiding that necessity to move data around between systems. Thank you. Thank you. So. You're confusing. Vast is. It's a different animal. It's a subscription, right? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we are fundamentally a storage uh, a software company. The reason that we are a software company is because software is where the, where the power is. No, no disrespect to my friends from Supermicro. Um, we are working with you and HPE and Dell. We work with all of them. Uh, but the power, as far as we're concerned, is in the software. But we need hardware to run that on, and parts of our architecture are using newer protocols and newer functionality that isn't necessarily available from the hardware manufacturers. So we do specify specific hardware that our product runs on, and we can sell that as a single, almost as an appliance model if that's what a customer wants. But sell it or let them subscribe to it? We, we or is sell, it both? We sell the hardware at okay. no markup, at just standard everyday street prices. So we use, for example, HPE and Dell for, for that top layer, that logic layer that I mentioned. And it's just standard everyday HPE and Dell servers sold at whatever the, the price they're sold for. Um, okay. Our smarts is in the software, and yes, we license the software, as do most you know, products. Even, even appliance, module, uh, appliance vendors nowadays are licensing the software. We're doing the same. Yes, we're not charging your markup on the hardware like an appliance vendor does. Okay, that helps. Students, you got anything? So I find the split between the logic and the storage of the data quite fascinating. I'd love if you could elaborate one on a little bit more how exactly that's done and two, if that brings any data safety concerns. Yep, so how it's done is that we actually use a protocol NVMe over fabric. So NVMe over fabric allows us to build out this very large um, Ethernet or InfiniBand network and have those logic nodes accessing the, um, the QLC flash that we have in the, um, in the data, in the you know, storage layer directly over that fabric. Uh, it doesn't create any uh, security concerns because the security is enforced by that logic layer and that's where all of the connectivity from the clients is coming through. So every one of those logic layer nodes can see every storage device but they're enforcing the, the security at that layer. And whether that's just security around standard access permissions, whether it's encryption, um, all of that can be done at that layer. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job. Good job. We now have the final. First, there's a lot of dangerous things around us here in Kruger. One of the most dangerous moves is to come to one of these sessions without any slides. Almost happened today. HPE got them in under the wire. They got to me two hours before the session. I put them in. Come on up, HPE. This is the final presentation, by the way. Then we vote. I don't know where they got stuck. Uh, I sent them out earlier. But in the end, these are contrarian slides. So uh, without slides, we can do just as well. Oh, However, no, you, no, you can't. Um, <laughs> there's, there's no commercials in here. So if you want an HPE uh, sales talk, go to the booth and talk <laughs> about products. This is questions for the audience. And um, the first one is really uh, on our HPC systems today. And I include all the hardware vendors, the component vendors, the software vendors like Vast. How do we have operational dials? Do we have the right ones? 
to tune our systems for performance, for safety, for security, secure operations, for sustainability. It goes back to one aspect of my talk this morning. I have a discussion here. We need better monitoring and life inventory monitoring to the level of did DIM serial number something move from REC A to REC B while I was trying to fix bugs or am I just moving the bug? We don't have that today. I challenge any vendor to give me a live inventory of a system six years after it's been delivered down to the supplier of the component. Um, that would allow us to do better data locality aware task scheduling, noticing that components are different even if they're spec the same. No H100 is the same to another one coming from the same facility uh, when it's delivered. We can do compiler instrumentation if the user can see that rather than the system admin only. That gets better workflow scheduling going. System reconfiguration and anything you want to fill in that box, let me know after the talk. Uh, that goes to the different pieces of uh, efficiency that I have on the right. How can we improve that diagram? That's food for thought. Ask me. Maybe Dan has a question on that too. I will. The second thing I want to bring up, because I was missing it uh, in the discussion so far, is quantum. Is quantum coming? How fast? Is it dangerous? Is it uh, chasing us or are we chasing it? Uh, I see us today somewhere with this idea of quantum in cryostats with two, five, ten qubits, all not ideal qubits. Um, maybe in five years we have some ideas how to run an algorithm much faster on quantum, whether we can do it practically. Good question, I don't have the answer. But we should be prepared for it, because we're scientists. We should play with gear that's not available in our thoughts, in our simulations, maybe on the first real devices. Um, but really, all of these opportunities coming up there challenge compute paradigms. And uh, if you're, like me, brought up in P versus NP debates, uh, get ready to discuss on the quantum equivalence of that. Get trained on probabilistic algorithms and understand that a good bound on a result is still valid for practical and safety purposes. It's not going away. And if quantum only gives you local solutions, you have local solutions. They may be fast, but they are still wrong in terms of optimality. Don't go for local optima. If you need global ones, go for secure ones with a boundary. Just reminding you of computer science too. And uh, then there's this 10 year plus horizon, and uh, I'm on that camp of 10 years plus, but there's fun on the way. There's all the other accelerators, FPGAs, CPUs, GPUs coming in, they're not going away. Because if you want to debug a quantum system, you're gonna need a classical one for the time being. So a simulation that concentrates, like in debugging uh, a reproducer of your Gromax in 20 lines that a developer can understand for the compiler, you'll need a quantum equivalent of that in tiny form that you can classically simulate. Um, of course, the next slide was killed from a presentation. Fine, yes, it was. But you killed also the first one that oh. had a nice animal to go with that. So anyway. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to show your QR code and a monkey. No, no, the first one. Yeah, why not? Oh, I missed the first yeah. one? I'm sorry. Aren't, aren't we all mine? So, so there's one missing that was on quantum. Who cares? Oh, what sorry is? about that. Okay, uh, and nice job. Uh, I'm sorry if I killed one too many slides, but I was in a big hurry because I got them no so worries. late. No okay. Um, for instance, on your first slide, system reconfiguration, aren't you or are you, is HPE working with any of the composable infrastructure folks? We are. So if you talk to the folks at CSCS, they're building what they call the reconfigurable system, the ALP system, mm -hmm. that allows multi-tenancy, dynamically changing who owns which part, which rec, which segment of the network in such a way that customers can bring in their own LDAP or not. So really reconfigurable, that includes the devices. But of course, that's a mostly homogeneous Grasshopper system, so it's not that interesting for the moment. Yeah, if you add storage and put NVMe assignments to jobs in there, it becomes interesting, right? Network attached. So you can change the configuration of non-local but local job assigned, customer assigned storage versus just a parallel file system, um, CPU, GPU assignments more dynamically. And as, as we go to future generations of hardware where there's more on the market than I want four or eight or whatever GPUs per node homogeneously, that's going to be there. I think and, that's and the, the key. The yeah. management system needs to supply that as a feature. Um, so the operator has a chance to do it. 
Okay, one of the things, this is kind of general. This isn't just aimed at you. It's aimed at other server vendors too. I'll take the question. One of the things that I've been noticing from talking to customers, this has been for decades, that customer comes to you. We have this problem. We need to solve it. This is hard. And they say, what should we do? The answer from you and others is, well, we can get whatever you want. Customer says, well, what do I need? Mm -hmm. Well, we can get whatever you need. It's all in our price book. Yeah. And customers need more. More guidance. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. there's everything you brought up here mm -hmm. and others have brought up and others have brought up is another choice, another decision point, many of which were not there right. a so, couple of years so ago. It's I another know, variable. Well, I get to do my commercial, of course, right? Which, yeah. Which uh, I didn't do this morning. So uh, my team is really focusing on doing the understanding part of what a customer needs when they're not in procurement, when they're telling us the real problem. And uh, that's what the research lab in, in EMEA is doing. We're, we're trying to be ahead of the requirements in an RFP that are vague. And then when pre-sales says, what should we sell to that customer? We know the codes, even if they're not benchmark codes. We, we try to understand what is this community versus that community asking and can influence maybe not the roadmap of devices that we offer and the roadmap of, of uh, systems that HPE builds. Ideally, that would be the case. We're still working on that. We're only eight years old as an entity. Um, and we come from the Cray side, which was smaller. Right? So um, in that sense, we're trying to influence that. On the software side, it works. On the hardware side, it cycles are longer. But we do understand what the requirements are. And so we can say, don't go for this product line. Even though it looks great on paper, it's not going to be the right one for you. So I think we're, we're doing a reasonable job as a small team in a small geography. Yeah. And if you're not one of the top customers that essentially drives industry developments with their RFPs, it's going to be a challenge. So you need expertise. You need expertise in the education of your, of your team to be a challenging customer that says, I hear you, but I don't believe this part. Explain better. At which point vendors will tell you, yeah, maybe we're a bit too quick, too quick telling you this is the solution because there's others. So agreed. Okay. But sometimes at the same time, the, the price list are too small. Yeah. There's, yeah. This is the offer. Uh-oh. We're, we're getting timed out by the moderns. Students, final question in this event. So uh, I love the quantum infographic. I agree with what you were saying on a classical system is going to be needed to debug it. But perhaps what wasn't clear is what is HPE's role in that whole process of right. an up and coming quantum. So system. HPE is an integrator. Um, and so if there are quantum devices that can be put at sites without fear of uh, shaking because of the fans or the liquid cooling <laughs> rattling next door or a tram going by or a train line. So if we have devices, the current belief of most people is they're going to be accelerators of some sort, not the main component, but the accelerator component. We're going to sell them either directly or uh, through, through partners adding to our systems. For the moment, we're not building accelerators ourselves, but we want to be, and we've shown that at supercomputing, someone from my team built a heterogeneous job schedule option where you can run a Slurm job, which has a lot of compute on classical devices, offloads a bit onto a fake quantum device, simulated, or offloaded to a cloud access to someone, and gets the result back. And you can share this scarce resource, because people will not have 50,000 uh, GPU cores equivalent as quantum cores. They will have one or two devices but they have lots of CPU cores and GPU cores left over. So this is the scarce resource you need to schedule around. So you want someone to block it for the minimum time. That's the kind of work that we're gonna be in because HP has a programming environment that tries to be conforming to all the standards, the real industry standards of languages, um, and then boil it down to whichever hardware you have to make code portable across vendors. We want to be supplying such a tool chain, but we don't want to build a tool chain that is the standard, but rather make it easy for you to move, including on the hardware level. Great. So. Thank you very much. Good job. Okay. We're going to get to the barbecue. Well, there's your other slide. Your slide was there. Your slide was there. You just had to hit the button. I've never been so insulted. 
But I probably will be more insulted later on by some of you in here based on this. So let's have a big round of applause for all the vendor participants. This was fun, I hope, for the student team and for the sponsors. Thank you for making this event possible. This is great. I love coming here every year. So who's going to win? We have winners, we have losers. Need my sound guy in the back, you ready? Watch your meters, tell me where the applause is loudest by holding up the number, and there should be eight. Who am I missing? I've got vast, okay, I'll, I'll add you in. You'll be eight, vast. So, who thinks Dell did the best job? Good job, mark that. Who thinks Intel did the best job? <laughs> no more banging on the table. Oh, who thinks Huawei did the best job? Yes! <laughs> NVIDIA. <laughs> Spectrologic. <laughs> we got to come up with a better way to do this, Happy, because this is doing. Uh, Super Micro. Yeah. Vast? Yeah! One really loud guy, good. And HPE. Yeah. Okay, this is really hard. Can you give me a clear winner from the back? Hold up fingers. Yes, no, we're not gonna wait. Five, five, Spectrologic, really? Good job, come on up. I don't know why I'm having you come up, there is no prize. Thank you, man, of course. Very good, good job. Thank you all for attending, I hope this was fun. Uh, what are we doing next, Happy? Where do they go, what do they do? Bry. Bry, where, what time? Well, you don't want people just wandering out into the bush. Out in front.